The true crime reporter never settles for standing outside the yellow crime scene tape. You knock on doors, dig through records, and cultivate sources to get to the bottom of the story. I'm Robert Riggs, the host and creator of the True Crime Reporter podcast, back with another story from three decades of investigative reporting. In this episode, I pulled out my reporter's notebooks, my law enforcement sources opened up their confidential case files, we sat down together to talk. And you can listen in to our journey into darkness. But before you do, be advised that this podcast is for a mature audience and not for the faint of heart. Some episodes may contain profanity and graphic details of violent crimes. To follow True Crime Reporter, text True Crime to 33777. Text True Crime, that's two words, True Crime to 33777. With that said, here we go on another journey into darkness. Kenneth Allen McDuff ranks among the most heartless and sadistic serial killers in American history. But what is it that creates the McDuffs and Ted Bundys of this world? That's a question that many of you have been asking me through the True Crime Reporter website, our Facebook page, and in reviews on Apple Podcasts. When I started investigating how the diabolical triple killer got out of prison on parole three decades ago, I asked those same questions. I received an invaluable understanding from two former FBI profilers who were among the original founders of the Behavioral Science Unit based at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. During my journalism career, I made many trips to Quantico covering stories about new FBI agent training, serial bank robbers, simulated training for arresting armed high-risk fugitives, high-speed vehicle pursuit training, the hostage rescue team, and weapons of mass destruction. I met profilers John Douglas and Roy Hazelwood after they had retired from the Bureau. At that time, they were not widely known outside of law enforcement circles. Today, the Netflix crime drama Mindhunter is loosely based on John Douglas's role in pioneering profiling at the FBI. His fellow profiler, Roy Hazelwood, became the world's leading expert on the strangest, most dangerous of all aberrant offenders, the sexual criminal. Hazelwood was an FBI agent for 22 years. He spent 16 of those years with the Behavioral Science Unit, starting with its inception in 1972. Hazelwood is now deceased. He co-authored landmark books about the minds of sexual predators with Stephen Michaud. Michaud is a friend and fellow investigative reporter who used to be based here in Dallas. Stephen is the expert on Ted Bundy. He tape recorded 150 hours of audio with the serial killer when Bundy was imprisoned in a Florida state prison. In 1983, Michaud and another giant of investigative reporting, Hugh Ainsworth, wrote the book, The Only Living Witness, The True Story of Serial Killer Ted Bundy. In 2019, Netflix premiered a four-episode docuseries based on Michaud's tapes titled Conversations with a Killer, The Ted Bundy Tapes. Bundy and Kenneth McDuff share many traits. Bundy received two death sentences. McDuff received three and was executed by lethal injection in the Texas death chamber in 1998. But McDuff, unlike Bundy, did not become a household name. Many of our listeners had never heard of McDuff before this podcast. McDuff was dubbed the broomstick killer for his shockingly brutal triple murder of teenagers in August of 1966. But publicity about the serial killer was overshadowed by the mass shooting at the University of Texas Tower. Charles Whitman, armed with rifles, triggered a 96-minute killing spree from the 27th floor of the tower. He gunned down pedestrians in a five-city block area on around the campus killing 14 people, including an unborn child, and wounded 31 others. At the time of the massacre, 
It was the deadliest mass shooting by a lone gunman in U.S. history. It spurred the formation of police SWAT teams across the country. And here's a coincidental factoid for you. Gary Laverne, the author of Bad Boy from Rosebud, The Murderous Life of Kenneth McDuff, who you have heard on the True Crime Reporter podcast, also wrote Sniper in the Tower. It's the definitive book about the mass murderer. In August of 1992, my reporting about McDuff and national news coverage was suddenly interrupted by Hurricane Andrew, which I covered. The Category 5 hurricane, the nation's costliest disaster at the time, devastated South Florida and the Louisiana coast. McDuff received a second reprieve from national publicity in February of 1993, when the Branch Davidian cult in Waco murdered ATF agents during a gun raid. I covered the subsequent 51-day siege by the FBI in the final moments of the fiery inferno. And know this, when I talk about cases on True Crime Reporter and the Justice Facts podcast, I was there along with the law enforcement officers you hear from. We do not regurgitate information found on the internet. We lived it. Now, here's my telephone conversation with fellow investigative reporter Stephen Michaud to help answer your questions about what goes on inside the minds of serial killers. It's a journey into darkness. Stephen, you spent a number of years with Roy Hazelwood, one of the early, maybe original profilers for the FBI. I think many of our listeners, their perception of the profilers has been shaped by uh, Silence of the Lambs and more recently Mindhunter, which is loosely based on John Douglas. Would you, would you give us an accurate depiction of exactly what they do and how they came about? Well, the, uh, the, the behavioral science unit uh, was founded in the early 1970s and staffed by the FBI uh, agents you just mentioned and several other ones. Most of them have now moved on. Um, but the, the, a core of what of what they did and do is <clears throat> trying to understand for law enforcement how a sociopath, or also known as a psychopath, operates. Um, and it's not the same uh, kind of study that you would see, say, from a clinical psychologist, because what they're really interested in is what you can do if you're in law enforcement, to combat what these people do. So let me give you a, a sort of a, 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 a little bit of an over, overview of it. Yes. Um, there's two features of the sociopathic or psychopathic personality that are pretty well established and have been for a long time. One is that they feel no guilt for anything that they do. And two, they have no remorse, um, which sets them apart from all the rest of us because, it's, in essence, you're saying they don't have a conscience. Um, I remember in my conversations with Ted Bundy uh, at Florida State Prison, uh, he uh, would from time to time go off on these long kinds of speeches about how he didn't feel any guilt and he thought that was a very liberating thing that people who go around feeling guilt for things that they've done are, are constrained by that and they can't fully appreciate uh, what's available out there. Um, for law enforcement, there's two other factors, though, that are, are, are very important uh, that you see, typically see in, in, uh, um, in, in sociopaths who are also serial killers, uh, and that's narcissism and paranoia. Uh, <clears throat> narcissism, uh, you could understand, I guess, best as self-love. The narcissist is fascinated with him or herself, um, and <clears throat> they tend to be very, um, uh, very charismatic. Uh, you'll see a lot of narcissists who will come into a company, say, or into an organization, and who very quickly uh, uh, create a following uh, because they're 
they're interesting. They, they, they're good talkers. Uh, they're bright, um, as a rule. Uh, but the, the, the sociopath who is, has, who is a narcissist also typically will have paranoia. And the paranoia is almost the opposite of the, of the narcissism in that there, it, it's fear. They, they look over their shoulders all the time. They're, they're, they're never really 100% comfortable. Now, in, in, in a criminal situation, you can see where narcissism would allow someone like Ted, for example, who was quite handsome and, and, and articulate, to bluff his way into in, in and out of any sort of situation and, and certainly approach unsuspecting uh, young females with what we would have called a few years ago his line. Um, and so the narcissism is a, is a tool, is a, is a personality tool. But the paranoia teaches them caution, teaches them to look over their shoulders. Yes. Uh, and, and is a kind of a pres- uh, preser- preservation, uh, if you will, uh, uh, trait. If you, uh, if you see these guys in court, uh, you'll see the narcissism when they stand up in court and say, I want to defend myself and my, and my own attorney. And that usually, that, that narcissistic move has underneath it a paranoid uh, uh, motive, and that is they don't trust their own lawyers. They don't trust anybody. And, uh, so those are examples of how, how that works. The criminal sociopath also exhibits, typically exhibits, a whole range of what they call paraphilias today. These used to be called, um, these used to be called perversions, but paraphilia is the new term for them. Mm-hmm. And a typical, I mean, a, a, a range of paraphilias would be um, peeping Tom-ism, looking in through windows, uh, making dirty phone calls, uh, exposing yourself uh, to, to people. Um, and the, the one that, that Ted, of course, was well known for was necrophilia, that he would kill a victim and then revisit her, her body um, uh, for in some cases weeks uh, because he felt inside of him that it was a way to get have some sort of mind meld if you will uh, with his victim so that's that's kind of a five dollar tour of what sure. you're talking about when you're talking about about killers sociopaths serial killers and 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 how their minds work well, and I'm focused on serial killer Kenneth McDuff. And interestingly, yeah, we've talked this about is, I mean, we're, I'm, my my information. Much of this I've gained personally, but of course, I sure. worked with Roy for a long time uh, on cases involving serial murder, serial murderers, um, and their and their habits. Yeah, and and uh, Roy's expertise was in the sexual criminals, right? And, right. Roy did not focus on on murder nearly as much as people like John Douglas has and uh, Douglas's old partner, uh, the late uh, uh, Bob Ressler. Mm-hmm. They did the that original well-known study of incarcerated serial killers. Uh, uh, Roy was really more interested in in, in non um, uh, how would you call it. Sex crimes, I guess, is just the way to put it. And there, of course, was a huge range of those uh, from uh, uh, pedophilia, uh, which is, uh, of course, a problem in this country, um, to to really specific uh, types of, of uh, criminal situations. One uh, one he called the uh, uh, <clears throat> the uh, complicit wife or a complicit companion. And Roy had done a tremendous amount of research on, on serial killers and serial rapists who had convinced uh, or their, their, their significant others or their wives to be their accomplice. And they would help you know, women who would help mm-hmm. men mm-hmm. find victims uh, and, and be, be actually part of the criminal, of the criminal uh, activity. Um, and in some cases, it actually went to prison with their husbands, or went to prison after their husbands were killed, something like that. Um, Roy, Roy's 
uh, ranged uh, into uh, all sorts of, 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 of strange sort of niche type of criminality. Yes. Yes. In some cases, it wasn't even criminality. It just was strange, like autoeroticism. Uh, he used to testify frequently in court trials where somebody was found dead um, in the most peculiar circumstance, like they're all tied up hanging from a tree or something like that. And he would meticulously point out to the jury that everything that they had seen there was consistent with the person uh, trying to achieve uh, uh, hypoxia, the lack of air, which, uh, <clears throat> is a, which gives you a high. And they would tie themselves up and hang themselves in trees and maybe get a cramp and some of that and couldn't un untie themselves and would die uh, these horrible deaths in the, co in the course of, of experimenting with sex. So, uh, you know, he, uh, Roy had an interesting way of, of explaining all this. He said, you know, think of, think of aberrant uh, criminals. And usually they're sexually aberrant. He said, think of them. As a as a nine person baseball team, now they all wear the same uniform and they all are playing basically the same game, but the third baseman doesn't have any idea what it's like to be a catcher, and the pitcher the pitcher doesn't know what the first baseman is doing. It's specialized, and no no two aberrant killer, serial killer or rapist is going to have the same set of paraphilias, the same set of fantasies. And the same set of of, of, uh, of preferred victims. They are all they are all unique unto themselves. And interestingly enough, they often are uh, amazed to learn of what some of their fellow killers like to do, and are disgusted by it. Well, they think that their own issues, yes. what they call sex, are perfectly fine. Well, and I'm focused on serial killer Kenneth McDuff in this series, Free to Kill. Yeah. And a number of the listeners are want to understand in the case of serial killer Kenneth McDuff, you know, right. what created this monster and what drives them. Now, in interestingly, when you talked about the narcissism, we saw that in at trial, at, at, at two trials, where he told his attorneys to shut up. He got on yeah. the stand and gave this rambling account that was ridiculous. But you could tell he thought he believed it, and he thought everyone that the jury was believing it because he was saying it. Uh, we saw that aspect of him. Um, well, you know, there, there's underlying a lot of this behavior um, is whatever sort of life these these people uh, led when they were quite young. I mean. There's a, there's, there's a great deal not now known about um, what kind of, of environment uh, is it, it, not completely determinative. I think it was important to, to emphasize this, that you can have a family of five children, all of whom were raised essentially the same, for all, from all, at least from all intents and purposes, and only one of them becomes a serial killer. So there's, there's obviously an interplay here somewhere between what you know what's going on around them and the way they're processing what's going on around them uh and that's you know that science is going forward but it's still pretty much in its infancy i w i can tell you though that a hallmark of the serial killer is the extraordinary anger that is evident what he does to his victims or she does to her victims as a rule um for example, think of Jeffrey Dahmer. Uh, he murdered his victims and then cooked them and ate them. Yes. <laughs> um, Bundy was a necrophiliac. Uh, he killed his, he would visit them, as I said, you know, post-mortem. Uh, but if you look at what, if their victims are found, if their remains are found, you often see evidence of this in, in, enormous anger. Uh, mutilation, uh, and there's a there's a theory um, in among people who study serial killers is that they have an inability to feel things the way other people do. Uh, their you know their their lack of guilt, their lack of remorse. They don't have the same set 
of, of, of tools, if you will. And one of their, one of their purposes in killing is, is, is anger at people who can feel things appropriately. And they, 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 they not literally, but figuratively want, want to consume that victim to try to, to, to try somehow to, to get from, steal from, take from that person the ability to respond naturally to the world around them. And so you could say that, that the serial killer in some ways is envious of his victims and wants to obliterate them uh, because they are a reminder that he's incomplete, that, he's, that he, is, he doesn't have what, what regular people do, um, and he's very, very jealous about that. Well, in the case with Macduff, uh, he was, it was rape and sadistic torture and long, long periods of time of sadistic torture, right. almost taking them to the point of death and bringing them back. But when he had reached the end of everything, his term was, I'm now, I'm going to use her up. That was always his term. I'm going to use her up. Yeah. The thing I found interesting, and I appreciate your insights from your background in, is that he always had an accomplice, and my my sense was it was performance art. Uh, he knew in the past accomplices had got him in trouble, but he still needed an accomplice. And when he was out hunting, he would have an accomplice. It was like he needed someone there to show off for. Working yeah. with uh, with Roy, did you ever yeah. see that in his work? Oh yeah, it's 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 not as common as as one guy or one person, one woman, because there are female serial killers. Um, but uh, a famous case was the Hillside Strangler out on the West Coast. Yes, um, a long time ago, and he had a he had a, a, a an uncle who was who was would go out and, and hunt with him, um, and and of course the accomplice. We spoke a little bit about the complicit uh, girlfriend or wife or whatever. Uh, that's an accomplice as well. Um, the what militates against an accomplice in these situations is the paranoia, because the paranoia will make him suspicious all the time, uh, and and so you can't really be a, a team if you if you don't trust the other person. You know what I mean? Uh, but uh, I think I think you've let your finger on something about it being performance art, because. You know, you, they do want an audience, and even if the even if uh, you know they're they're lone lone wolf killers, the way they leave the body is a form of performance art. Uh, you know, some of these guys will will position their victims in a very specific way uh, because they're having a uh, they're having a conversation, if you will, with the investigators who are are are, are chasing them down. And they will have something that they do that no other killer does, and, and the cops who are studying them are aware of that. And it becomes a part of the game between the, the hunted and the hunters uh, when the hunter becomes the hunted and, and vice versa. It's, uh, um, it's very primitive, um, but it's very, very, very kind of deep behavior, if you will, um, so yeah, that's a roundabout way of saying yes. You're right; they they do have accomplices at times. In the weeks in uh, leading up to his execution, he was convinced in one case, tricked into revealing the location of some of his victims. And it, uh -huh. seven years later, he knew the exact spot and told them exactly how the the body would be positioned in the grave yeah. and they were buried in very, very remote areas. They would have never been found unless years yeah. later there was excavation or something remote rural areas, but he knew exactly where they all were. Well, you know, there's another, there's another strain of these guys. Um, I've studied a lot of them uh, and written about a lot of them. And one of their fantasies, a common fantasy among these guys is to own a super furnace for incineration. And they, they actually have fantasies about building one way out in the, in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. and maybe having a buried house and buried uh, garage at the same time so they could live 
unseen and, and they would have a place to go do what they wanted to do uh, and then dispose of their bodies. Um, and uh, that it's almost like they all read the same cookbook sometimes, you know? Well, one of the things we know he did do, and we know it from all this underworld of ex-cons he traveled in, and they all talked to investigators. And one of the things he would do is be driving in the rural central Texas and places and then suddenly look over and say, that would be a good place to bury a body. It was like he was always looking for that yeah. special spot. Yeah. Well, he's a hunter, right? Yes. Um, and it's a, and you know, it's, Ted said to me on a number of occasions that he should have understood that the real thrill was not in the actual kill, but it was in the stocking uh, and planning of it, because that you're 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 exhibiting your your power and your intelligence, and and to and to insinuate yourself into somebody's life and have them not even know that, that you can kill them at any time you want is a huge thrill. Um, I don't know about McDuff, but I know Ted and, and other serial killers have uh, uh, not atypically would break into a woman's house while she was asleep in bed and just stand there or occupy her space and then leave without, without her ever knowing that he was there. And maybe do it several times until he says, "Oh, now, now it's time to kill her." Um, again, it's a, it's, it's. There are a lot of different power gradients than the rest of us. <laughs> and McDuff was about abduction. He was a huge yeah. man, and it was about stalking and grabbing. And interestingly, in an, talking to investigators shortly before his execution, he described it as the hunt. He was on yeah. the hunt. That was his word, the hunt. And mm-hmm. they got his credit card records for months and months and tracked him. And he drove hundreds and hundreds of miles. Yeah. You know, um, there's something to that. Uh, serial killers don't, as a rule, gravitate towards big cities. Um, and one of the reasons for it is that they are like any hunter, any, think of any any uh, top of the food chain predator, lion or whatever, and they rely upon stealth and they rely upon having control of the situation. And I remember talking to Ted about it. And he, he said, "You know, I went to New York City, so but you know, how can you, how can you, how can you, you know, stalk somebody when you don't know when you know all of a sudden, you know." Um, the, the, you know, an explosion is going to hit or, or there's a car wreck or, mm-hmm. you know, it's New York city. It's, you know, it's wild. It's, and it's, it is wild. And so these guys really want to be, uh, away. They want, to, they have to go into cities and towns to get their victims or, or get them as they're hitchhiking say, but they the idea is to get them out and away as far as you possibly can to at your, at your leisure, if you will do what you want to do. Well, interestingly, too, he had a preference. Uh, his victims were in their 20s. I noticed they were slim, petite, small-breasted, short. Um, and he typically would grab them by the throat, lift them off of the ground, feet dangling, them kicking, and control yeah. them. He's, he had a massive size hands. He'd do this one-handed. What is it about they, they have a preference of a type of woman they're looking for? Well... Robert, serial murder, sexual serial, sexual serial murder is driven by fantasy. The fantasy is the, is the foundation uh, urge, if you will. And you can understand what they're doing as a, an attempt to achieve in real life what they have fantasized about. And so their fantasy, I was, when I was talking about the baseball team, I sort of touched on this. Mm-hmm. They... Um, their fantasy begins off in most cases when they're quite young and, and it, and it evolves as they get older. Uh, so that a, an 18 year old serial killer might have a very different victim, uh, pool, if you will, at at 18 than he he would if he's still active when he's 25. Um, and they, these fantasies are, are 24 seven with them. They, and they, they go to, uh, they go to uh, uh, sex shops, uh, video stores, books, whatever, 
looking for images that that they can incorporate into their fantasies. Um, and then they look lot, looking for victims who approximate what they're fantasizing about. So in, in the case of, of uh, uh, Macduff, he he had an ideal woman, an ideal, you know, that, and and you know, he he's he's not going to preferentially he's not going to attack a woman who does not as come as close as possible to the physical uh, type that he's looking for. I remember asking Bundy once um, um, about uh, when he was talking to me in the third person. I said, well, how does this person select a victim? How do you know, how, how do you do it? And I said, well, for instance, you know, would you, would you, would you uh, attack and kill uh, an, an unattractive woman, a woman who's not, least unattractive to you and he looked at me sort of haughtily and he said well everyone has their standards so um again this point where you know mcduff had a very very specific to him mo uh, uh fantasy um and all the and all the tricks of his craft that kept him ahead of the police for a long long time unfortunately well, before his execution, uh, one of my friends, Gary Laverne, a writer down here, you probably know Gary, wrote Sniper in the Tower. He interviewed McDuff. Uh, McDuff just talked in circles. But there was one interesting point where Gary said, uh, uh, Kenneth, what was this preference for prostitutes? And he, McDuff laughed and said, uh, well, it's kind of hard to get a date when you've been on death row. Well, they're a victim class. Um but you know, there's a lot of victim classes. There's yeah. small boys. There's old women. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's uh, prostitutes. I mean, in the case of prostitutes, I mean, where else do you find somebody who will come up to your car and willingly get in the car with you and drive away, right? Right. right. Uh, you know, without having to subdue them or anything, right? Yes. Yes. Stephen, let's pause for a moment. I want to take a break, and when we come back, I want to talk about, again, the the, the making of a serial killer. Okay, Stephen, we're, we're back from the break. Uh, we were talking earlier about the making of a serial killer. You know, it's the old question, is it nature or nurture? What did you learn from Roy Hazelwood on that question? Roy, Roy never um, pronounced himself so uh, so sure of his research and so so you know so uh, certain of, of his conclusions that he would ever come down one side or the other on that issue. Um, Roy Roy once told me that if, if I you know if I if, if I or anybody uh, told him that a uh, uh, a uh, uh, a palmist had called up and said she had seen a vision of, of something happening uh, out in the woods that she thought was close to what you know we, that he was looking for. He would go out and talk to her uh, because you never know exactly what you know yes. what she has in her head. Um, but to the nature versus nurture, I, I don't think um, that you can come down. Um, on either side to the exclusion of the, of the, of either side. And my personal experience with Ted, he, he, he felt that there was something inside of him that was a predisposition that he was born with, that there was some kind of flaw in his, 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 his mind or his, or his being, but that it had to be triggered that you, you, without a trigger, that flaw would not necessarily express itself as murder. Uh, his example was that if he had lived in a uh, more repressive uh, society, less free society than, than the United States, he might have ended up being a demon stamp collector instead of a murderer. That, and, okay. um, but I think, I think without putting thoughts in, into Roy's head and words into his mouth, Roy was very sensitive to anything, uh, whether or not it had to do with nature or nurture, that would advance 
you know, his knowledge, his practical knowledge, again, of, um, of, uh, of serial murder. I, uh, another, uh, another investigator who you, I'm, I'm sure, knew, uh, uh, Bob Keppel out in Seattle, who yes. chased around after Ted for a while. When he started invest, when he started interviewing him, um, Ted kept saying, "I want to, uh, uh, I want to talk about the antecedents and what you know, what made me who I am, and the why of who I am." And and Keppel said, "I'm not interested in the why. I'm interested in the what, where, and when, and how." Yes. Um, and you know that's those are two different cops talking about the same thing, but it's, it's, uh, it, I, I think it illustrates how it's, it, you have to be careful about getting yourself too carefully into one camp or the other, that these guys are not all the same. Well, one thing that really struck me in McDuff and the investigators was his mother. She was this domineering, mean, mean figure that going back to his days in elementary school, she was called the pistol packing mama because yeah. when the bus driver scolded him on the bus, she showed up waving a pistol around. The, the entire small town of Rosebud in central Texas was scared to death of this woman. And then during the manhunt for him, the investigators ended up afraid of her. Uh, and all of them told these stories of just how nasty she was, and always defending him. Always that you're framing him. He was framed for his murders in 1966. Uh, yet, on the other hand, there was a sense when Gary Laverne spoke to him in on death row before the execute final execution that he hated his mother. Should we? What? Well, and some people yeah. said, "Well, that mother was." That's the stereotype right there. I think you could. I think you could make a case that. Whether or not there was overt craziness, um, beatings, maliciousness, whatever it was, that you could use a broader term and say that she was not available to him in her mother mode. Um, uh, Ted, Ted's mother was 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 the paradigm of, the, of a sweet little old lady, uh, but it was clear that. Uh, you know, that he had some issues with her. Um, and, you know, and there were other things wrong with his, with his early, mm -hmm. his early uh, upbringing. They, they, they you know, these guys don't come out of perfectly balanced, healthy families. Uh, I'm not sure of how many perfectly balanced, healthy families there are, but they, they undergo, they undergo stresses, and they undergo experiences when they're very young that imprint on them. And uh, uh, depending on how, you know, what they're exposed to later on and, and, and a lot of other uh, 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 changeable factors, they, uh, they do or they do not um, graduate into becoming stereo children. You know, um when we see them, once we know they're a serial killer and we know these monstrous, you know, horrendous acts that they've committed, yeah. they're spooky looking. They're, you know, oh, they, we think they look like a pervert. But the thing that I found, particularly with McDuff, if you wouldn't talk to people that had worked around him or been in a trade school, he looked normal, kind of normal, just plain. Didn't really yeah. notice him. One... Uh, person a convenience store just crying he said well, he, was, he, he was kind of goofy on the other hand i talked to cellmates when he was in maximum security prison said he would be that way and then you could trip a switch and this violent rage would come out and it, it would scare everyone to death uh, so much so that he went through prison with no tattoos and no association with the gangs although he leaned toward the aryan brotherhood the racist group uh, but that was kind of the kind of fear that he he carried around. But on the other hand, this seemed normal. When I've been con contacted by listeners, that are like, "Well, yeah, what should I be look on the lookout for?" Ah, uh, yeah. Do they well, look like a monster? Does the child abductor look spooky and scary? And I'm I'm always like, all the well, ones I ever saw look pretty normal until you really hear what they did. 
yeah, you you're touching on something that's very important is that they 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 don't jump out at you. Um, the, the ones that who are um, who are clearly troubled, uh, you can you know you, you can see them a half a mile away. Probably are psychotic. They're 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 uh, schizophrenic. Uh, they have psychotic breaks. Um, they, you know, they, they do strange things. Uh, the people we're talking about have a personality disorder. Um, they're, 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 uh, they're not, they don't fit into the, into the psychiatric categories of the, of the really mm-hmm. mentally ill. They're, um, they look and, and talk and act like all the rest of it, which makes them, um, so effective and makes them so chilling for people to think about. Uh, and I, you know, uh, mixed up from what I, I know, which is not nearly what you know, was, was not distinguishable from, from any other guy who, uh, you know, who came out of the same world that he came out of. It's only, um, it was only when, when he was actually acting out his fantasies that he was clearly you know, who he really was. The rest of the time it was hidden. Um, and the, you know, the, the worst mistake you, you can make if you're a member of the victim class is to think that you can spot somebody who is, who is clearly a, a, a proto serial killer or is serial killer. Um, they are, they, you know, the, uh, they're one of us for better or for worse. Um, and you know that's that's not going to change. The only thing that will change is how they get what they want, which is I think now today. I mean, Guff never would have been much of a uh, hand on the internet, but if he were around today, you can bet that he would be on the internet. Yes. Well, uh, you, I remember in one of your books with Roy Hazelwood, he talked about there were two essential lessons from his casework, and one was. There are no boundaries to what a particular individual might do to other people. And secondly, when it it comes to sexual behavior, there are no limits to what a person might find erotically stimulating. Yeah. How how, how do you apply that to his work? We talked about that a lot. And the way way, uh, Roy um, handled it, he said, you know, it's when you talk about uh, with these people or about these people, you got to remember that you're talking about what they call sex and what, what, um, what McDuff called sex, uh, was very different <laughs> from what other people, most other people call sex different from sane people or, or, or non, the, those not afflicted with personality disorders, but also, as I said, Different from other other killers, uh, the uh, the the variety of things that will interest people um, is sort of inter- is, is is one of the 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 hallmarks of this. As we talked about paraphilias, uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all to learn if it ever came to light that McDuff was a crossdresser uh, that he did it just because. He wanted to see what it felt like, mm-hmm. um, or that he that he may have, in fact, uh, picked up a small boy or or somebody who was not in his victim class just to see what it felt like. Um, so, you know, they, as a, as a, as a, the behavioral science unit, you know, they call these people trisexuals. They'll try anything, um, and it's uh, it's not it's not at all unusual. It's not at all. So it's and again a, a, a warning to anybody who would who would become a profiler or become a detective is to say that you know everything you need to know about this person that you're hunting because you don't. Well, back when I was on McDuff's trail and ferreting out the corruption in the parole and prison system that had released him, uh, Roy provided you know a couple of pieces of very valuable advice to me to understand this, and one was he said look, he's always on the hunt. 
he might be going out for a pack of cigarettes or a six-pack of beer, and if he sees that preferential victim, he's going to strike. Secondly, he said that, look, one of the most sec- uh, most strongest primal drives of human beings is sex, and if you tie that to violence and pleasure, there's no one going back. There's no rehabilitation. You've, you've got trouble on your hands. He talked, uh, Roy talked a lot to Park Beach, the, the psychiatrist, and, uh, and I did too uh, in those days. And, and Deitch was very interesting about that. He said, you know, um, what bothers me or worries me about violent movies uh, is that they often will have scenes, there'll be sequences where there is uh, sex, there's you know, a sex scene, and it immediately is followed by a really violent uh, uh, murder of some sort, and that the the, the viewer uh, is unconsciously connecting violence with sex, uh, and it's and it's and it's it's reinforced by what he sees in this movie theater with all these regular people in there. It, it tends to legitimize it, uh, and. So yeah, I mean, I, mm-hmm. Roy gave me the same lecture, and it's, it's absolutely true. They, they are. Um, it's never very far, never very far from their their uh, their conscious mind, um, and it's by far their most favorite thing to do. Well, you know, in your two thousand one book, Dark Dreams, that you did with Roy, Roy, at that time said, "This is nineteen years ago." Said, there, said saw two disturbing trends. One was there was a conceptualization of crimes at a much earlier age, and secondly, the, uh, the, the fantasies he thought were growing more complex and in some cases deadlier over time. What do you think he would say today? Well, you know, there's more input. I mean, you know, just take yourself back to, say, the 1880s <coughs> um, in, you know, and, and you're living in a frontier village. Um, you know the the sensory inputs are are pretty sh- are pretty shallow and 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 not at all sophisticated. I mean, um, you you know then compare that with with the sophistication of modern pornography uh, or whatever you want to call it, you know, sexual literature, mm-hmm. um, and a, uh, a a person who is susceptible to this message. Has this huge uh, 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 variety of, of, of different types of, of sexual behavior that they can incorporate into their own private fantasy and make it more sophisticated, make it more um, uh, uh, make it more pleasurable, if you will, and drive them harder and harder to try to make it and try to make it real, try to recreate it in their their lives, which they none of them ever figure out that they can't do that. It's not, you know, a fantasy mm-hmm. is not the same as the real, real right. world, but none of them ever understand it. They keep chasing it right to the end. Stephen, I was always struck, really just amazed by Roy's ability and the other members of the behavioral science unit to analyze a crime scene and do, then do what they call victimology, study the victim and come up with a profile of who, uh, they surmised did it, and it was pretty doggone accurate when you they caught the people. It would help catch them, and so Roy engaged in a thing called linkage analysis of where looking at mo and ritual characteristics. Can you kind of go into that and help our listeners to understand how do how do they do that? Well, linkage, linkage. He's talking about looking at two different crimes. And seeing if there's there are things, set times that you can see in the crime scene or what is ever known about the crime scene that links it to another crime scene, uh, and therefore strongly suggests that the same person did both these killings. Um, they try they try to to uh, to uh, computerize that with with VICAP, the violent uh, is. Uh, violent offender apprehension program. Uh, specifically, though, 
linkage analysis, and here's an example uh, that Roy told me about one time. We wrote about it together, actually. There, there were, um, um, there's a, a killing, and in associated with the killing, they, they discovered that there were a bunch of, of small ceramic items um, that had been very carefully lined up on the sill of a, of a window, a window sill. Uh, they were small little animals. I can't remember what, exactly what they were. And Roy pondered that and pondered that. Uh, he said, you know, uh, that's a clue. And he says, but I don't know what kind of clue it is. Um, and, but on a, a kind of a, almost a, a whim, uh, he, he, he went around and canvassed, uh, local nearby facilities for the criminally insane, looking to see if that, he could find that kind of behavior. And he did. He found, he found, he interviewed a guy and he was sitting in the guy's room with him. They said all these little things lined up on this. And that was a linkage. Um, and he was able to, to, to kind of, uh, back investigate it. And the guy, in fact, was the killer. Uh, and he had, um, he had managed to get into a, uh, <clears throat> into a, uh, um, uh, facility like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, but he was given away by the linkage. So yeah, the linkage is, he was, Roy was great about that. And, and, but, you know, it almost, that, that kind of thing almost gets into, do you have a feel for this kind of work or don't you? Um, and, you know, Roy was highly intuitive. Um, and, and the whole BSA was sort of a, an intuitive organization. They, they really rested a lot of what they, they taught and, 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 and talked about with old police detectives who had gathered all this, this incidental information in long careers. And it was the kind of stuff that when these guys would retire, all their knowledge would retire with them. Yes. And so Roy and, and, and the rest of them tried to systematize that a bit. And that's, you know, that's where the, the linkage analysis uh, came from. Uh, it was also, you know, you, uh, you're certainly familiar with an organized versus a disorganized uh, uh, crime scene. But tell our and, uh, and, and that, you know, Roy came up with that idea in the shower. <laughs> um, and then he just went out to see if, you know, if, if you, if you could test it empirically to see if, you know, is it, is it, just something that I think may be interesting or, or is it, is it real? And it turns out that there, there is a correlation. It's not the only correlation, but if you find a, a, a scene, a crime scene that is really messy, disorganized, uh, you're going to see signs of that disorganization in, in the killer himself. Uh, likewise, an organized crime scene, which, which, which indicates planning, care for details, all that sort of stuff, that you will find traces of that in how this guy uh, runs his own life and kills other people. They, it's very rare for a, an organized killer to become disorganized or vice versa. Um, so that's what I say with, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it, a lot of the things that they accomplished was really the pulling together strands of, of lore and, and experience uh, in an, in a, pardon the, use the word, in an organized way to make it available to other, to other, uh, uh, uh criminology, cr criminologists, uh, and detectives. Well, of course, we, we'd both been to the FBI Academy at Quantico, Virginia, sure. where new agents training takes place, but also they bring in, uh, local law enforcement to the Academy for training. And, yeah. uh, in that basement, that's where the behavioral science unit was located. Do you do you think the FBI has still got the commitment to research like they should? Well, you know, politics operate uh, at a pretty fever mm -hmm. pitch in any federal bureaucracy, and uh, the I, I, I haven't had any contact with the, the BSA directly in a long time. Uh, they come, they sometimes contact me about specific killers, career stuff, but so I can't speak. Too, uh, with too much authority on that. 
um, uh, the, the serial killer thing was so strange because, as you know, it, it, it kind of came out of nowhere with Ted back in the 70s. Yes. The, the, you know, the term itself hadn't even been made up at that point. Um, and that doesn't mean there weren't serial killers before. It's just that they, they had never been, you know, recognized. They're kind of like a new species of, of you know, of killer. Um, and uh, it really caught the public's fancy. Um, and, uh, you know, people wanted to become criminal profilers and, and all the rest of it. And I, I don't know that if, if, they, if, if they're if they still adding significantly to their, their trove of information. I, I really don't know. Um it's a boundlessly industry, interesting subject. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they're doing other things as well. Right. I mean, they, you know, they're, they're off, they're doing a lot of stuff, uh, internet stuff and all that, which wasn't even thought of back when, you know, they were chasing around after, after Bundy and, and, uh, and your guy. So. And of course, after nine 11, much of the FBI's focus turned to terrorism. Uh, well, there I, you go. I, mean, I that, remember that, working on a big investigation of widespread mortgage fraud, and there was one loan agent. His side yeah. was overwhelmed, and yeah, well, um, there, yeah, yeah. And he's yeah. and he and he said to me, Robert, you could do me a big favor by saying going reporting that uh, international terrorists are involved in mortgage fraud, and I'll get plenty of resources. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. I mean, I, I can, I, I can imagine somebody saying that. So, you know, what, one thing that helped uh, McDuff evade capture is that he committed his crimes in different counties. So there's different policing jurisdictions and they don't really talk to each other. Do you think we're better at that today? That kind of show? No. Okay. No, no. I, I, I talked to investigators a lot. Um, just in the course of, of, people I've known for a long time, people I've known because I'm still actively writing about this stuff. And it's, it's still the same problem that it was in, in, in the year uh, 1975. Um, there is, there is, there's ter- territoriality. Um, there's, um, there's laziness. Um, there's, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, uh, it's, Political. Uh, I I was involved in a case not too long ago. I can't be specific about, but there very very good chance that it was the the, the remains of one of Ted's unknown Ted Bundy's unknown victims was buried about half a mile from a police station, and uh, they the cops would not get involved with it. They would not have anything to do with it, and and they basically shut down the whole thing. So. Um, there, uh, it's still a problem and it's, and smart criminals, um, especially smart, uh, aberrant criminals take advantage of that. And they are smart uh, in yes, their they own are. way. Well, they're, in their, they're, they're clever. Yes, they're clever. They're very they're clever. predators. As, you know, you probably could learn a lot about serial killers if you just watched your cat. <laughs> okay. Now we've just made every cat lover on this podcast mad, but, uh, <laughs> well, I, look, my cat is asleep, uh, right here in front of me, mm-hmm. taking all this all in. He doesn't seem upset with me. So, <laughs> um, one of the things in the McDuff case that really, uh, struck everybody, angered lawmakers was that, of course, there was corruption allegations surrounding his parole. Yeah, but the one thing we learned was that not, it wasn't just in his case, but they, the parole board was turning loose, oh, hundreds of violent offenders. Yeah, and we learned it was not like the movies. There's not a hearing where the offender comes in and sits down and states his or her case. It was they they passed a file to each other, and oftentimes the members didn't even read the file. They just kind of right. rubber stamped what one lead member thought, uh, and also it's a political appointment. And what struck me is there's no forensic psychology requirement and really no uh, protocol for evaluating, is this person a, a danger to society if we release them? I don't see that that's changed. What? How should we be approaching that? And what do you see? Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm reminded 
of a kind of reverse situation that you, of course, remember as well as I do, Henry Lee Lucas, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, Henry Lee uh, may have killed three or four people, maybe, uh, and he was at one point good for 600. Um, and police departments, not just in Texas, but all over the country were, were closing cases based on Henry saying, yeah, I did that one. Um, and they didn't even, they, they didn't even go so far as to figure out, well, if, if victim X yes. is known to have died, you know, on a Monday in, in El Paso. And we know for a fact that Henry who had, didn't have a car that could go more than a hundred miles, which the, the next day was in Virginia. He probably didn't do that killing. Um, but the case would be, uh, cleared and the, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, the file would be lost or, or thrown away. And, um, this speaks, I think, to your point is that the, um, the, there's a lot we could do, a lot more we could do, uh, to keep people safe from these people. But, you know, all of it has, comes down to, um, to budget in one part. I mean, in one, in one sense, I mean, uh, an example apart from the, the, the forensic stuff or the forensic psychological stuff, look at all the police, uh, uh, agencies that have got rape kits and DNA kits that are in some cases 10 years old that have never been processed. Right. Right. Um, and they don't, they can't do it because they don't have enough money to, to hire the people to do it. Uh, so that's a big issue. That's a big issue. Uh, you know, you, in some ways I think you get as much police policing as you're willing to pay for. Um, and, uh, uh, and as we discussed, there's fashions that uh, that that uh, sweep the uh, the area. I mean, there was a there was a great outcry about about uh, about McDuff when when the issue of him and a lot of other guys being cut loose uh, as in a slapdash way, as you described. Uh, but nobody came forward and said, "Okay, I can fix this. Here's the plan." Uh, but you have to vote a, you know, you have to vote us another million five to do this. And all of a sudden there, everybody's enthusiasm for saving lives kind of goes out the door. All comes down to money. If, if, yeah. Roy, if Roy Hazelwood was sitting on a parole board and had a violent offender to assess, how do you think he would approach it? They would never put him on a parole board because he would take too much time. You know, they're, <laughs> they're, they're, so. they, they process things. As you pointed out, um, and you know, I don't know if you've ever taken a deep look at who's on parole boards, um, but they often have no background of any sort right. that suggests they would be able, be any better able to evaluate whether or not this person has a paid his or her debt to society, uh, and b more importantly is a, is is a is a ongoing threat to society. Um, and I, I think Roy would say, shit, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know if I want to make that bet myself, but uh, I'll remind you of yet another very interesting Texas story. But you remember Dr. Death, the psychiatrist yes. who, who in the penalty phase would always say that this person is a threat. If you, if you don't execute him or lock him up. Correct. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was, you know, it was easy. All he had to say is, yeah, he's a threat. And, you know, and, and, you know, statistically, he probably was right. And, you know, he probably could apply the same kind of logic to winning at dice at a, in a casino. But it, it, he didn't have any special insights or know anything. He, uh, and that's why they call, they called him Dr. Death. He was a very nice guy, by the way. I'm sure you knew it. Well, the forensic psychiatrist, Park Deeds, yeah. that you've worked with. Yeah. What, what do you think he would have a methodology of how, how we should try to look at this to protect society? I mean, Deeps will tell you that short of having a prisoner come at you with a, a knife uh, the moment you meet him, it's a delicate and sometimes really involved process to really get to where you need to to be able to make an informed judgment about these people. Um, they, uh, uh, they tend to be pretty clever. Uh, it's hard to observe them 
in a, in, a, in their environment, which is, in, you know, they're incarcerated. Um, that's when they're behind bars, their demons tend to recede a little bit. They certainly did with Ted. If he didn't have pictures uh, or, or, or access to, to, to young women, uh, just, just, you know, a bunch of, of prisoners, um, he wasn't getting the stimulation that led, led to the behavior. So, mm-hmm. um, I, I just think that, that, that in our current state of knowledge and willingness to, 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 uh, devote resources, uh, it's, uh, it's probably a vain, probably a, a vain, um, uh, uh, exercise. I mean, there's that guy, Dr. Uh, Hare from, um, Robert Hare. Canada, who's, yeah, Robert Hare, who's done that, that, uh, socio, sociopathy, sociopathy, uh, checklist that it's kind of a way of, 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 uh, breaking it down. And, you know, and it, and it seems to be pretty useful in some circumstances. But, you know, I, I can tell you stories all day and all night about people who were cut loose, uh, after having been interviewed by, you know, 15 different people and they went out the next day and killed somebody. Right. right. Um, and not, and not, you know, not the gross problems that, that, that you know about with, with, uh, uh, your guy, but you know, these are, these are, are, are trained professionals who know about aberrant behavior. They, they made a mistake. So, uh, what do you do? So one of the other questions I've had from listeners from the, um, women in the audience is that, well, what, if, what do I do if there's an attempted abduction at, uh, you know, the car wash or gas station, what have you based on your experience, any, any advice? If you, if you go into, uh, any reasonably well-functioning police, uh, uh, station, uh, and, talk to them about missing persons. Um, you'll get that, you know, we get, you know, we have 15 missing people reported here every week and 14 of them, uh, are just girls spending the nights with their boyfriends. And the 15th one is a runaway. We don't know what happened to her, something like that. Right. And they'll say, we don't have the manpower. We don't, we don't, we, we mm-hmm. can't, we can't be running down these things where we know statistically they're, they're liable to be just, you know, they're, they're mad, they ran away or whatever it is. Um, and they're going to say, you know, we can't keep everybody safe unless you want to have cops on every corner. Roy would have said, because Roy did say to me that, you know, that we could do a lot more self-policing in this society if we cared more. Um, but we tend to deal in stereotypes. Uh, we tend to deal in, in an over, uh, over hype, uh, thing. We have, we love stories about, you know, the missing girl who finally found two weeks later and the viaduct, all the rest of it. Um, there should be something in society, uh, short of uniform policemen, um, that, that responds to that. Um, I'm not making a prescription, but I'm just saying that, that I, I don't still think that you're, you're ever going to have the, 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 the time, the resources or the money uh, to have so, such a well-trained uh, force to, you know, to actually be able to respond real time. And I don't know if, you know, in this society, if, if the cops said, you know, the only way we're going to do this is we're going to have to put, you know, surveillance cameras everywhere, uh, which is basically what has happened. Um, but everybody's going to say, well, where's our privacy? Well, <laughs> there you go, right? Trade off. Uh, I do, I, I, I do point out when I speak about Ted is that he would have to completely re, re, revise his mo because you know he would walk up to girls in parking lots. Well, today they would get him on a camera, right? Uh, so he would have, you know, he would have to come up with something. He would have to adapt, if you, if you will. Um, but I, I know I'm kind of wandering around here now, but I, I just don't, I think that the, the societal alterations necessary to make people safe from these people, really safe from these people are, you know, are pretty much beyond us right now. 
Well, that's a good point to conclude, Stephen. But before we do, tell our listeners about your the Netflix special you were involved in and, and some of your other books where they could get more information. Well, um, gee, there's a lot of them out there. Um, there's uh, Roy and I did two books together. Um, and uh, one is uh, uh, The Evil That Men Do. And the other one is uh, Dark Dreams. They're both still available in, in, in soft cover. Uh, I've, done, I've done a bunch of books about Bundy. I did a, I did a, a book about a guy who's not very well known uh, named, um, last name was De Bartolaven. Um And it's the, 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 the current title of the book is Beyond Cruel. Uh, and De Bartolaven is, is dead, deceased, but he's he's kind of every veteran police detective and FBI investigators candidate for the absolutely worst criminal, uh, lone lone wolf criminal who any of them had ever encountered. He did everything from uh, bank robberies to counterfeiting to rape murders, uh, abductions. Uh, I mean, he did everything. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and if you want an introduction, you want to learn some more about Roy, there's quite a bit in there. He he brought the case to me, uh, and it was certainly one of the more interesting ones that I did. I uh, Maybe I've seen too much of this stuff. <laughs> well, Stephen, you've also done the series on Netflix. Tell us a little about it. Netflix came about because... Uh, when I interviewed Bundy uh, at Florida State Prison, I tape recorded, audio tape recorded all our conversation. Um, and uh, and tell everybody uh, briefly how you got in for that interview. It's amazing. Well, <laughs> well, there's a reason why you don't see me in Florida too often uh, anymore. I guess I'm okay, but I I basically lied my way in. I uh, uh, I told the uh, the authorities and my partner Hugh Ainsworth was involved with this too, that I was a, uh, an investigator working for, for Bundy's, uh, for Bundy's, uh, appeals attorneys. And I got myself a PI license and I got a friendly attorney to walk me into the, the prison one day. And then for the next six months, I, I just visited dead on death row. Um, and, uh, it, there, were, <laughs> there were some moments, uh, I, I was certain that at any moment they were going to open the door and say, please come with us. But uh, I got through with it and it was, uh, it formed the basis of this uh, four hour series that ran on Netflix uh, years. I guess it's still on uh, called conversations with a killer. Uh, and uh, it's a, it's an unusual uh, set of tapes because it, you know, I spoke to him for six months Uh and I had to devise some little tricks to get Ted to talk. Um, and so he reveals himself indirectly in the, in the third person, uh, but then from time to time moves into the first person, and it's all on tape. Uh, so I, if you've got a TV and you can get to Netflix, I'm sure you can see it. It's an interesting exercise. Four hours with Ted's a lot, though. Stephen, what do you think it is with our fascination of serial killers and violent criminals, uh, especially among women? I know my, my audience is about 70% female. Yeah. Uh, and I've had some uh, send me emails saying, you know, I listen to this and I, I, I wonder if that significant other in my life might hold some dark secret. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know... I've pondered this a great deal. Um, and I, I, I remember vividly sitting in courtrooms where Ted was being tried and front row center would be all these young girls, young girls, teenage girls. And there was a, um, there was a, a, an untrue story about Ted that he had a, he had a weakness for, uh, girls with long hair parted in the middle and wearing hoop earrings. Um, and it was, it, there was not a, a bit of, of truth to it. The only thing that was true about it was that in the early 1970s, uh, into the mid 1970s, a lot of girls wore long straight hair part in the middle and, mm-hmm. and hoop earrings. It was fashion. 
But these girls would come to, to uh, court with their hair parted in the middle, grown out long, wearing hoop earrings, and t- try to get Ted's attention. And he would, you know, he'd every once in a while lean back in his, the defense table and give him a little bit of a smile. And it was like Elvis, uh, the Beatles. I mean, it was amazing. Um, and they were fascinated by it. Uh, I, I, I still get a lot of correspondence from people, uh, girls who are now not girls anymore, they're in their 70s and 80s, who are telling me stories of the night that Ted raped them. I think, you know, maybe some of them are true, but I think a lot of mm-hmm. them are fantasies. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's something about that. Uh, and that's, you know, that's, I don't think guys have that quite that same fantasy, but guys fantasize about Ted in a very different way. And that is that they look at how he got away with what he got away with for so long. Uh, it, you know, maybe this, you know, maybe there's something primitive in, in men that, that respond to that, but they, uh, uh, women see Ted the way a potential victim would see him. Yeah. And, but a man, no man can ever, a very few men, I guess, would say, could ever consider what it would be like to walk into a bar and know that there's very possibly somebody in that bar who would like to tear your head off for you. Who's, you know, mm-hmm. um, it's, 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 it's the fact that these, these guys move among us undetected and undetectable. Um, and then we start saying, well, if they can do that, they must have supernatural powers. Uh, there, you know, if nobody could do that, well, it's really easy to do. I, I, I remember, when I did a lot more talking about this, I, I would say, you know, you probably would have a lot more luck abducting and killing and, and getting rid of the body, getting away with abducting and killing five women than stealing uh, five airplanes yes. <laughs> or, or maybe five candy bars. Um, it's a, uh, it, as long as, as long as, is the victim can't be connected to the killer by the normal uh, connections of family, friendship, all the rest of it. If they are stranger crime, um, they are very, very hard, very hard to solve. Uh, and you know, I, the example McDuff, I, I have no doubt has got bodies, uh, scattered around in Texas that will never be found. Um, and, and I know that Ted, um, certainly has bodies scattered all over the United States that will never be found. The investigators do believe that about McDuff. They think their bodies all the way up to Kansas, perhaps in yeah. Mexico, that will never yeah. be found. They also think there are other accomplices that got away with murder. Well, that would be for, well, again, McDuff is your, your, your area of special expertise, but, uh, you know, he found that MO to work, to have some, you know, some, somebody along with him uh, that worked for him. Uh, so he, he would repeat it, um, you know, when appropriate. And so, so for, yeah, for our listeners, MO is typically the behavior meant to ensure that the yeah, uh, killer's success Wait, he gets, yeah, he gets away with he, it, protects his identity. Yeah. You could call it their signature, right? Uh, that they, they know that this works and that this does not work, but it, it's important to, to add when you talk about that is yeah it's, it's how they operate and it's and it is informed and directed by their experience but also really important to it is what's going on in their heads and their fantasies because it's it's what they're trying to do is 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 fulfill a fantasy uh as well as not get caught so, so you have you, know, you have more than one agenda going on with a, uh, an mo so does the fantasy then play into what we call the ritual, the behavior that heightens yeah. their cycle? Yeah, yeah. Ritual behavior is it's a, it's, it, it is ritualized, certainly. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, it, it's a uh, uh, yeah. You they all if they if they don't get caught, they all change over time because the the fantasy is never static, um, and they learn. You know, sometimes they learn new things. Uh, just in the course of, of committing their crimes, and they say, "Whoa, is this fun?" or whatever. Uh, let me try this or something else. Or, you know, and some of them pick up tips 
when they're incarcerated. You know, these guys, you know, they, they talk to each other about trade craft, right? Yes. Um, so that's a, that's another rich source of, uh, of inspiration, if you will. Well, Stephen, thank you for sharing your years of insight. I want to tell our listeners, Stephen has been described as one of the world's best true crime writers. Um, I encourage you to pick up his books. You can't put them down. Stephen, thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert. I, uh, um, I don't know if you can ever say you can enjoy one of these conversations, but I always, uh, I'm always glad for the opportunity to, to talk about this stuff because it's, there's a lot of room for mistakes in, in what people think about. And I, I try to be an apostle for, for clear headedness if I can. True Crime Reporter is a trademarked and copyrighted news show hosted and written by me, Robert Riggs, executive producer, Elizabeth Arnold. Audio production by Matt Stoker. Original music by Blair King. Associate producer for audio and video, Siler Burr. Social media producer, Grace Woodward. Publicity, Tim Livingston, PR. Photography, Igor Kurgulots. If you like this podcast, I invite you to subscribe to our Justice Facts podcast, where our true crime stories are stranger than fiction. And our SWAT Brothers podcast, featuring stories from SWAT team veterans and military special ops, plus advice for first-time and experienced gun owners. Available on all of your favorite podcast apps. Thanks for listening.